Okay, well, uh, thank you everyone for having me here. Thank, me, thank you for making this basically an impossible presentation. <laughs> um, uh, when I set out to fulfill this particular part of the agenda uh, before getting here and, uh, and thinking about it as much as we have over the last couple of days, I really put, uh, put it together with one question in mind. Um, and that question was, what characteristics will make CMA2 a successful coastal web atlas? And I put a little asterisk there to say that I want to go back a little bit later in this presentation and talk about what that means, what that phrase, coastal web atlas, means. Um, because uh, I can't tell yet if what a coastal web atlas is matches with what you guys want a CMA2 to be. Uh, but then taking, starting from this larger question, I, I had to break it into two, two sub-questions. You know, what are we discussing the functionality of? Are we discussing functionality of overall CMA2, of national contributors and their relationship with CMA2, uh, regional co uh, partner contributions as well? Um, and then functionality for whom? If we build something, who are we building it for? Is it for the general public, local organizations, national level? stakeholders or regional parties and larger bodies. Those two things are very important. So, who, you know, who is the atlas going to be built uh, to serve and what would those users need from an atlas? And of course, we've talked about all, we've talked about elements of these questions, especially all day today. Uh, and because Alessandro and Marsha both talked about stakeholders quite a lot, and because all of you know much more about the actual stakeholders in your region than I do, I'm just going to talk about audiences from the perspective of myself, and I'm a technical person. Um, I might be someone, the kind of person who might help uh, my organization build an atlas, if my organization had to build an atlas. And from my perspective, one of the very obvious things about these audiences is that they vary widely in size as you go up this list from the bottom. Uh, and when you get to larger and larger audiences, uh, it gets a little bit more and more scary as a technical person <laughs> because maybe my server has to be bigger to satisfy all the traffic that they might generate, for example. Um, but then other things happen too as the audience gets larger or as it gets more localized. For example, the data, the resolution of the data that they require uh, goes up because, you know, uh, for example, take the topic of hazards, coastal hazards. Maybe if I'm an agency staff at a national level, I might be interested in the whole coastline of my island and how it, the, the hazards, a particular hazard distributes along the length of the coastline. And I might know that some lengths of my coastline are worse than others. But if I'm a local homeowner or something like that, I really only care about my house or my beach you know, that, that, that I'm near, nearest to. So the resolution of the data that that, that person needs in order to feel like a, a map of hazards is useful to them needs to be higher because they want to kind of see, they want to see themselves in the map um, in order for the map to be useful to them. So these are the kind of things that I think about as a technical person when I look at audiences. And when I see a giant list of stakeholders, like I do for this project, it, uh, it's a little troublesome. Uh, and I immediately start to look for ways to simplify the problem. So we might have 50 people in this room, but we don't have 50 types of users in this room. We maybe have five types of users in this room. And even if I just looked at the, the five types of users in this room, if I looked at your information needs from an atlas, they might have many things in common. So maybe I could consolidate down to just a handful of information needs that the types of people in this room would require out of an atlas. So those kinds of simplifications can help me identify the things that I could actually build in my atlas. Um, but then the other thing to consider when you have multiple uh, audiences is that you may never be able to resolve things to common products that satisfy everybody. So you have to, as I think Patrick said, consider the possibility that you need to build multiple tools or entryways into your data to satisfy multiple audiences. So I'll just leave that there. So other things that have been expressed over the last couple of days. You know, we want better national engagement in CMA2, 
than I apparently was for the, uh, the case in CMA1. We all want better sustainability of the platform, which means we want it to be relevant over long, the longer term. And uh, there's been a lot of talk about a uh, desired better approach to data sharing, which means basically a better relationship with contributors of data. And so I would put these out there as questions. How can CMA2 make a meaningful contribution in this environment, this environment between contributors and audiences that need to be served? Okay, now I'll go back to the little asterisk that was on the first slide and talk about, you know, what is a coastal web atlas? Is this thing something that actually will meet the needs of uh, the project that's been defined so far? Uh, Marsha showed this quote uh, in her presentation on the first day, and she didn't read it. Um, but, and you don't have to read it either, but I want you to think of the atlas that was on the back table on the first day that was, had the UNIP logo on it, a traditional book atlas. And think about the attributes of that atlas. You, know, you can page through it and systematically look at different parts of a region that the atlas covers. You can look at different theme themes that the atlas covers illustrates the same theme across different regions. So these are the kinds of things that an atlas provides in a traditional format, and when you transfer it to the web, it gains additional pow superpowers. You know, you can suddenly link documents to it, or you can do analyses in them. And those are the kinds of things that you could do if you think you need to build a web atlas. <clears throat> I did bring a copy of this book that uh, I can put out a couple of years ago, and I'll circulate it around the room if people are interested. But many of the lessons from atlases that have already been established are captured here, and it's very useful for people who are thinking of building an atlas to look through it. Another useful resource that's out there is on the ICANN website, there's a member directory. And there's upwards of 70, 80 projects listed here, all people around the world working on coastal or marine topics. And if you want to browse for ideas for the kinds of things that are being done in atlases, problems that are being solved, this is a great place to look. So now I'll talk directly about you know, aspects of coastal web atlas functionality. I've got to talk about four things, sort of the building blocks of an atlas, the front end user interface that everybody sees, uh, some back-end technical features for how you support the front-end and uh, other supporting features. <clears throat> I would say when you boil an atlas down, these four things are the minimal components that make something an atlas on the web. If you're serving out maps, somewhere somebody has a map engine that's taking your thematic data and making pretty maps out of it. They may, may be making static maps out of it, or they may be making dynamic maps. But somewhere, there's a map engine. There's also, obviously, the thematic data that comes in, either from your organization or from your partner organizations. And then when you add a place gazetteer, when you add the index of all the locations in your region, that's when it becomes an atlas. That's what allows somebody to compare one area to another, to keep the geography static and change the theme, once you add that third element, it starts to become an atlas. And then the fourth building block is documentation. And notice that I didn't use the M word here, because it doesn't necessarily have to be, uh, on the surface, formal metadata. But it does have to be information that uh, gives the user trust in the data that's being presented, and also helps them understand it. And it's great if it is, of course, backed by formal metadata. But these are the minimal requirements here. So stepping to talking about characteristics of a front end, most everybody, when they think of an atlas, will immediately think of an interactive map. And I will show a few slides of interactive maps. Marsha showed a, a great example of the Marco portal, which is really relevant for regional interactions. Um, this is a screenshot of one of the interactive maps on our atlas in Oregon. But every interactive map has the same elements, is the point of this slide. You always have the map itself, the thing, it, you know, you maybe can zoom in and zoom out, move around. 
There'll be the cartographic choices that someone has made in the map and in the thematic data that's presented on top of the base map. There's the navigation for getting yourself around the map, but also around the content. Some maps will have very complicated tables of contents. Others will force you to only look at one theme at a time, which is a little bit like the book model, but is actually extremely successful with users. And then, you know, the superpower of being on the web allows you to interact with the map. Click on it, get information out of it. Maybe, you know, in more complex tools, draw a polygon and extract an analysis result out of your polygon. Those are the building blocks of an interactive map. And often the interactive map is the primary thing that people think of when they look at the front end of an atlas. But I think part of my argument here is going to be this should not be the only thing you think about when you think of building a web atlas. Of course, the book, the atlas, has pages that have maps on it, but it also has pages that have photographs and text. And I think that those elements can be as important as the interactive map. So, um, looking through the ICANN member directory, you know, for inspiration on different things, you might uh, look at neighboring atlases to your region for examples of data that are available. So this is an example of the Gulf of Mexico atlas, and uh, you know, an interesting cartographic display and also list of data layers that are available just over the edge of your area of interest. I think that's an interesting one for you all to look at. Uh, you might look at for, uh, you know, you have a big complex region, potentially lots of information that would be shared. How do you not overwhelm the user? Well, in Washington, they did a very interesting interface where they present sort of a Chinese menu uh, at the beginning of the process where the user can tell you, tell them what they're interested in. And then when they look at the map, it has been customized to the user's needs. So this Chinese menu entry into the map uh, is kind of a, a great idea. And you don't see this very often, but it's very successful in their case. Um, if your atlas is targeted um, at people who like metrics, um, I, this is maybe, I wouldn't, I don't know if the OHI guys consider themselves an atlas, but I use their sc screenshot from their website just as, because it's a great example of displaying a metric. And in fact, it's like a compound metric, so it shows you multiple things in one, in, in one information presentation. Um, and so if you think that your atlas is going to have those kinds of uh, pieces of information to share, you might consider just building a display that is capable of symbolizing information in this way. And then last but not least, because these screenshots could go on forever, these are examples of, uh, in turn, sort of a pretty pop-up on a map that could come from really any web map. Um, on the left is, a, uh, is also from the Gulf of Mexico Atlas, an example of how do you present in one user sidebar descriptive information about your map, legend information about your map, and uh, the stuff that technical people like, which is the metadata behind the map, the, the web map services behind the map, the data download behind the map, uh, and even the original sources behind the map. So the fact that the Gulf of Mexico Atlas has every, uh, every map view that you can look at has this kind of level of detail hidden behind the legend is really, uh, well, it lends a lot of credibility to the data being presented, but it also um, immediately as a technical person, I'm like, ooh, I can grab that, I can put it in my map. This is so already much more useful than just me being able to look at the map. So that's, that's a great feature. Uh, and then down at the bottom here, in the bottom panel, is a screenshot from the Marine Irish Digital Atlas. And it's just an example of uh, one of their pop-ups that, that have, appears below their map as a user is browsing around. Um, it would explain, you know, what is a special area of conservation uh, in the Irish context? You know, so it might show a picture, might show some icons, uh, might show some text that explains what it is, because I'm not from Ireland, so I don't know. It's very helpful. <clears throat> so those are all things to do with the map side of the front end. Now I'm going to jump and talk a little bit about the back end. 
And then we'll come back at the end to a little bit more of the front end stuff. Um, so uh, I think I mentioned that if you're serving maps on the web, somewhere someone has a server that has a map engine on it. And coming into the server are map layers from various parties, either from your departments or your partners. Uh, they come into the server in one format. The server does some transformations. And depending on the requests that come to the server, it will sling out a map, or will sling out a clip, zip, and ship of the data, or will sling out a templated report uh, based either on static areas that are predefined or dynamic areas that are drawn by the user. Um, all these things uh, that might be outputs require different software or services to be supported on the server. And Yassine is going to talk a little bit about those things in his presentation. I think the point here from terms of functionality is that depending on what you desire to come out of your atlas, uh, that will dictate the software and services you have to build into your server. And there are a lot of other things that go into the design of the backend. Yasin is going to talk a lot about potential architectures that, uh, that can be probably debated for a long time. <laughs> OK, so now I'm going to circle back to the thing from the front end that we left out. We mostly talked about the features of an interactive map. Um, but really, an atlas, even in a traditional atlas, um, the maps are not everything that's there. There are often lots of text and supporting images. There's often featured thematic content that explains you know, the meaning or the benefit of a marine protected area before you show the data of a marine protected area, for example. Um, is a way of presenting that kind of information is a way of drawing your audience into the content um, and in a way explaining to them why it's valuable to collect it and valuable to share it. Um, the, the two examples that I have here in the screenshot on the left is from the Washington Coastal Atlas, an example of one of their most popular products in their atlas. You know, here they, they spent years on their beautiful web mapping interface. And yet, one of the most popular things that they serve on the web are oblique photographs with a tiny little reference map you know, that shows you where you are. But really, people don't care about the map here. They want the photograph. And it allows you, the interface allows you to browse the photos from left to right, north to south, whatever, and follow the coastline. And the relevance, the number of audiences that that product is, is relevant to is huge. It's relevant to tourists, it's relevant to realtors, it's relevant to people who study hazards, it's relevant to biologists. So sometimes the, at the thing that's successful in your atlas is maybe not what you thought it would be. So this, I guess including this example is um, an invitation to keep an open mind. Because flying this photography is actually not all that expensive. This is traditional handheld photography aimed, you know, perpendicular to a plane or a helicopter. It costs, you know, $50 per kilometer to fly it. And when you put it on the web, you don't need a fancy web server. You don't need a fancy map server. You need a, a, a web server that can just sling out photos when requested in sequence. So it's just interesting to know that sometimes what's popular is not what you would expect. The other product, uh, uh, listed on the right, is uh, a snapshot of uh, coastal county economic reports from the NOAA eNow uh, Digital Coast website. So these, I would call these uh, pre-templated reports of specific, uh, pre-specified geographic areas. Um, they can be thematic, they can be th thematic by sector, but they're very nicely presented. Um, they allow you to look um, at multiple, you know, you can, you can pull down multiple counties at once and compare across counties the same kind of metrics. Um, because the, the units of counties are pre-fixed, pre you can really actually pre-compute all these reports. Every time the data set is refreshed, you can pre-compute all these reports. So nothing complicated is required of the server. They just need to be able to serve the information out. Of course, the more complicated version of this reporting would be if you allowed the user to define the geography 
and have the report contents be customized by the request of the user. And that does require more complex server-side support because the data that would be appearing in the reports needs to live in a spatial database. You have to have a map interface that supports the user drawing something and taking that input, analyzing it against the database, and filling the template back up with results. But still, it's really nice to know that these kinds of reports are actually also extremely popular products of coastal atlases. And when the geographies are predefined, and I, when I was listening to the, most of the conversations here, a lot of the conversations were about predefined geographies. Um, you can do a lot with predefined geographies that doesn't require very complex server support. If you want to get fancy, you can start talking about the custom geographies. Um, and then the last point to make about supporting features, because I think these are, uh, it, these are such very important uh, contents for an atlas, um, is that sometimes people forget there's a lot of this stuff. And uh, when you have high volumes of it, you may need to add to your server environment a content management system. Because, you know, who wants to go through a thousand photographs? Well, we'll give that to the intern. <laughs> well, what's the intern going to do with them? You know, how, how does he know how to interact with the server? Well, if there's a nice content management system, it's really not that hard for the intern to uh, populate metadata about the photographs or upload them into the system, et cetera. And so uh, that's why you see people sometimes using things like uh, Alfresco was mentioned in your presentation, or in my office we use Joomla for our coastal atlas. It just makes it easier to, ha to uh, partition the work of content management out to multiple people, because I can give someone an account, they can edit the part of the website that they care about, they're, they're specialists in coastal hazards. Well, here's the key to the page on coastal hazards. You know, make sure that it's as accurate and up-to-date as possible. So, just another function. Uh, if, this is, uh, if you see this as a functional need of the atlas, then that dictates a requirement on the server. Okay. So bringing this all back to the beginning here, um, when I initially showed this flow here, the implication was that, you know, oh, the CMA2 is going to bring in all these things from contributors and pump all these products out to audiences. And I think we know that, um, well, I think it may be obvious that um, if it's all one directional, the benefit doesn't accrue to the contributors. So that's a problem. So the relationship that the CMA2 has with its contributors needs to be two-way. And the relationship that CMA2 has with its audiences needs to be two-way. And Marsha gave examples from the Marco of how the relationship with their users is two-way because they, off they solicit feedback. Um, one thing she didn't mention, I didn't, and I didn't know this until... I read my email yesterday or this morning, but uh, Marco does something for their community. They call them How Tuesdays. So, and I don't think I could do this if I was an Atlas uh, owner every Tuesday. But uh, they apparently on Tuesdays they have a one-hour webinar where people can call in and ask how to do things on the on the Atlas. So it's like a helpline or office hours for their Atlas. Um, so I got invited to How Tuesdays on the 2nd of September. I put it on my calendar because I'm kind of curious what it's about. Um, so that's an example of two-way interaction with your audience. Um, but how, how do you have a two-way interaction with your contributors? Um, uh, especially when most people are already tasked 120% with their regular jobs. And this is an extra 20% on top of that. In your, your interaction with them, maybe another, I don't know, 10%, I'm not sure. Um, and this is a problem not just for CMA2. This problem exists in all kinds of projects that solicit input from any kind of a volunteer. Um, and from that world of sort of volunteerism, there are some principles about how to design a system so that people are more incentivized to participate. Um, and I put those three bullet points here. Uh, the first is to give people credit for their, their contribution, right? And I like to think of OBIS as being a great example of all three of these, actually. Um, if I'm a bird guy and I'm on you know, a particular beach somewhere in Oregon, I might be the world expert on that, the birds on that beach. Um, what's my incentive to give my data to OBIS, right? Well, the first incentive is that 
when anybody sees my data in OBIS, it comes with my citation. So that's, that's great, okay, maybe that gives me some points from my employer or something like that. Um, but really, that's not the big, that's, that's, that's of benefit to some people. The big benefit is maybe I'm the world expert on birds on that beach, but you know, I'm not really a technical person. I really like looking at birds. Um, I compile all my data about the birds in Microsoft Excel, because that's the only thing I have. I don't know. I give it to Obis. All of a sudden, everybody over the world can like get my data in a CSV, in a GeoJSON, in a WFS, and then blah, blah, blah. So I didn't have to do any of that work. Obis did it for me. And I can be the customer of some of those things. And I don't have to learn how to make GeoJSON, so I can go to Obis and get it. Um, and then the other benefit that Obis gives me is that, uh, so, so, you, so, so the second principle is give, give them back their own data with improvements, all right? Um, so you're trying to, you, in that way, you're basically saving them some work, making their job easier. The, la the, the last principle is that I put my data in and uh, it's not just a one-way street. I, uh, Obis also is a format for all of my friends or rivals in the bird industry and I can go get their data too. And before I might have been too afraid or not interested or too shy to ask for other people's bird data. Now I can get it, I can get it anonymously, it's shared under the same terms that my data is shared, etc. So those three things really incentivize people to participate and so if you can build those kinds of things, those kinds of functions into your atlas, it might improve participation from contributors. On the audience side, um, I already talked about um, sort of direct engagement with your audiences, but at the building stage, I think what you need to know is, you know, who are, are, who, what types of users do you have? And for every type of user, can you profile the needs that an atlas might fulfill for them? Uh, and then design the atlas functions around those needs, especially those needs that fulfill um, multiple user profile. So that, you know, as from the builder of the Atlas's perspective, if I put the effort into this one, two, or three things, I'm going to solve the problem for six or more user types, for example. Um, and then the last thing is uh, just the selection of the technology to match the functions that you're requesting. So that's, that's it for the functionality slides. Um, I think that most of the points that I made have already been made in this room by various people. I know Fernando made some, I know Chris made some. Uh, I felt like I was hearing my presentation from the back of the room. Um, but maybe having them all in one place helps give, you know, give us the building blocks for a further conversation. Yes, thank you, Tanya. Thank you very much. Uh,